Thank you very much for the introduction. And so what I'm presenting today actually isn't uh, a research that we've done. It's a hypothesis that we put forth while we were at a uh, summer astrobiology school. So uh, what is astrobiology summer school? So you might have uh, received emails if you're on the uh, NASA Astrobiology Institute newsletter uh, about this. Basically, it's held every year in Santander, Spain, and you get uh, three days of astrobiology lectures. Um, and then uh, a fourth day, uh, we go out to an excursion to an astrobiology-related site. But we also have these projects that we work on throughout the week. And then our project eventually uh, kind of progressed to something a little bit more that we continued working on after the astrobiology summer school. And then uh, something cool about uh, astrobiology summer schools, outside of learning things about ast astrobiology, you make uh, some friends, as shown here. And these three guys uh, helped me escape uh, Spain. I was a little bit stuck. And uh, Peter Liu, uh, Divya, helped me um, uh, catch a train. Uh, back to the airport in Madrid. Um, but uh, so what was the basic uh, idea here during um, our astrobiology summer school? So uh, it focused, if uh, you could simplify everything here, uh, we basically discussed uh, what life, need, what life uh, actually needed and uh, simple components. So first thing is a liquid solvent. So uh, most people think of water, but it doesn't necessarily uh, have to be water, according to some people. Uh, so a source of nutrients, and then, of course, energy. If you don't have energy, uh, you're in thermodynamic equilibrium, just like Nessie here entered back in Memorial Day. Uh, so uh, definitely a source of energy uh, uh, to power um, uh, life. And then um, our group was the energy group. And so we discussed about uh, how life might uh, utilize beta decay or um, a particle radiation from uh, planet, planetary magnetospheres. And one of our advisors came up to us and she's like, hey, you guys should write a hypothesis paper about this. And so what's a hypothesis paper? Well, it's exactly uh, what it sounds like. And I'm just going to go through some examples of what other people have done. So uh, Reynolds uh, et al. in 1983, uh, their hypothesis was that life might utilize um, uh, the planet, planetary magnetosphere of Jupiter as a source of life, basically having um, the particle radiation hit the surface of the ice on one side um, and having that current uh, go, go down through um, a subsurface ocean, forming uh, hydrogen and oxygen, uh, basically splitting water apart, uh, that, that would then be able to uh, power life. And then Hibble and Phillips in 2001, also using uh, particle radiation, um, this time uh, talking about how organics might fo form on the surface of uh, Europa, and then that getting cycled into the uh, subsurface ocean that can then be uh, utilized by life. Uh, more recently, uh, John Johnson et al. Um, in 2014 uh, discussed uh, the Workman-Reynolds effect. Basically, what that is is uh, when ice freezes, it um, uh, freezes in uh, some uh, cations or anions, uh, preferentially uh, de depending on the conditions. So you can form um, uh, a voltage there that where you can also split water and form hydrogen and oxygen. And then uh, recently here, uh, actually in uh, 2015, discussed how you can use a particle radiation on Mars, basically forming a secondary uh, particles that can then go down to the surface um, and uh, help uh, power uh, subsurface microbes on Mars. Uh, so our hypothesis paper kind of dealt with the idea of um, organisms using a current uh, directly. So uh, this isn't a, a completely crazy concept because terrestrial organisms go ahead and do that. Uh, so uh, we have uh, Shawanella and Geobacter as um, being the first uh, couple organisms that can use an electric current uh, directly from a cathode and then basically uh, take oxidized products to create reduced products and then uh, Semetic and Franks here is a good review paper uh, on that topic. And so 
uh, with this hypothesis, we kind of need, uh, had everything that um, uh, we needed um, to basically propose uh, organisms using a uh, current on IC worlds. So uh, we do have a, a liquid solvent in some of them. In the case of Europa, you know, a kilometers uh, down um, or within the surface, um, um, just because you know it's so cold at 150 Kelvin, uh, water is definitely frozen on the surface here. But if you're not utilizing water as a solvent, uh, that becomes uh, less of an issue. Definitely have your a source of nutrients on a number of icy worlds. And then the source of energy that we were using was particle radiation. But uh, there's an issue with particle uh, radiation uh, because most of it is so energetic enough uh, that uh, it, uh, you know, as mentioned, ionizes everything and uh, destroys uh, the molecules that you're using. So what we proposed was that energy uh, can be um, uh, dissipated here by uh, having the electrons come in and forming secondary electrons, which would be lower in energy, then eventually going uh, so low in the energy of 1 to 10 electron volts where you're no longer uh, ionizing anything. And uh, so we propose the same thing as what uh, terrestrial organisms do, um, basically having a cytochrome C analog, which is what uh, Geobacter uh, uses uh, to capture electrons, um, having the electrons come in and uh, uh, reducing uh, your compounds uh, that way. We also had a, a secondary hypothesis that we worked on, which we called indirect uh, electrophy. Also, uh, we gave it another name, fluorosynthesis, and um, meaning will become clear in just a second here. So um, with the particle radiation, uh, coming in and forming secondary electrons. Uh, we also propose that the electrons uh, might cause another molecule to fluoresce or release photons. And then uh, in that case, you would just have a process uh, directly analogous to uh, traditional photosynthesis with the organisms using the fluorescent uh, photons um, uh, to power life. And so this is kind of a diagram of what happens here. So you have an electron or another particle that comes in, and there's a, basically a cascade of electrons uh, that comes through. Um, and then uh, each uh, lower in energy than that first initial one. You've got most uh, going further down into the ice, but you have some escaping. Uh, but we needed a way uh, to uh, quantify the number of secondary electrons produced. So we could come up with a current and determine how uh, much biomass we could expect to uh, form. Uh, so uh, we start off uh, with this equation here with uh, this little epsilon here, basically being how much um, energy is um, being uh, transferred uh, to the ice uh, with each uh, secondary electron that's uh, produced. And this just describes uh, how much energy is being lost here as the electrons going through the ice. Uh, so what are these two values? Uh, this one um, comes out to about uh, 25 electron volts. And then here, uh, we can estimate this value here by using uh, this equation. Uh, this energy is the energy of this initial electron right here. And then R is uh, just um, this equation here with um, and this just being the density, and this also being the initial um, electron energy here. So we can uh, recombine these equations to uh, get a uh, derive a number of the secondary electrons coming through here. So we uh, made some estimates uh, using this. And uh, so we already have here the uh, secondary electron flux, how we calculated that. So we uh, just started off uh, by looking at, OK, let's say uh, we have 100 particles coming in, uh, looking at uh, both uh, water and nitrogen ices, both uh, common in the outer solar system, uh, Europa being an example of a water ice, uh, Pluto and uh, Triton in Neptune's moon being examples of nitrogen ices, um, calculating the uh, penetration uh, depth using a program called E-STAR, uh, which is of uh, usually available unless the uh, government's going down through a shutdown like it was a couple years ago. Um, and um, 
uh, using uh, this secondary electron flux and this uh, penetration depth. Um, we can uh, come up with the number of electrons flowing through, um, and we can convert this to a current using the uh, definition of what an ampere is. Uh, so it's uh, 6.241 uh, times 10 to the 18th particle, charge particles uh, moving uh, per second. Um, and then we had, uh, we had to come up with the conversion factor uh, for converting the uh, movement of electrons to uh, grams of biomass. We did that by basically uh, just uh, looking uh, at uh, photosynthesis and treating it as um, a transfer of elect electrons. That's essentially what life is after all, just uh, transfer of electrons. So we just um, used the um, uh, wavelengths of, of light, uh, converting it that to how many electrons were being um, transferred within the photosynthetic process and uh, coming up uh, with the uh, biomass this way. And then um, the es estimated number of cells is just based off how much um, the, um, uh, based off the weight of an E. coli. Uh, so coming up uh, with this uh, conversion factor. Um, and then uh, this is uh, better shown here with uh, a graph here. So just starting off with how many um, particles uh, we had and just uh, starting off with our initial radiation flux and just uh, moving forward, uh, we can come up with uh, an estimated um, biomass. So definitely uh, probably overshooting here if the average uh, surface uh, biodensity on Earth is being exceeded by uh, Europa and Ganymede. Um, <laughs> But, um, and so here uh, we're showing um, the, the two uh, uh, different types of ISIS, um, but both pretty uh, comparable here. Um, so uh, we didn't account for, um, of course, uh, nutrient sources or anything like that. Um, but um, I'm going to move on to the relevance of the calculations in just a little bit. Um, and then uh, same thing here, um, estimating uh, the biomass from uh, indirect electrophy. So this, again, being what we uh, also termed as fluorosynthesis. Uh, so it turns out that ice uh, fluoresces uh, when you irradiate it with electrons, one of the uh, wave numbers that uh, comes out is, um, uh, or photons that comes out is uh, 306, uh, at, is it found at 306 nanometers. Uh, so um, there was already some work done on what the photon yield was from that. Uh, we also converted that uh, to its uh, energy value in electron volts and uh, created um, an electron yield uh, based off of that. Um, and then we did uh, same calculations here, one just based off the amount of photons uh, being uh, produced, so just assuming that uh, one uh, of these photons would be equivalent to uh, one uh, terrestrial um, uh, photon um, yeah, that's used, or sorry, that's used in t uh, terrestrial photosynthesis, but also used uh, one based off the energy flux uh, from those photons, since they're higher in energy, uh, you're being supplied with a little more. Uh, but uh, in terms of an order of magnitude, doesn't really make uh, much of a difference in uh, terms of how much uh, you form. So it shows the. Uh, same thing here um, with uh, the radiation flux uh, uh, just uh, going out here showing uh, how much uh, you would expect in terms of uh, biomass. And again, um, uh, lower than the average uh, surface biomass density on Earth, uh, but still uh, fairly high here. Again, not accounting for uh, nu uh, nutrients or anything like that. So these estimates are definitely high, so how are reliable are these? Um, so uh, one of the things that we, uh, first things that we did in Spain was we were actually looking at beta decay first. And with uh, beta decay, uh, when we apply these same um, calculations here, um, they didn't really get uh, substantial amounts of biomass that were uh, able to be supported until we looked at uh, these guys here. And these are waste products from uh, nuclear reactors. Um, and so we also see uh, high uh, biomass estimates based off those. And it's interesting because uh, just recently um, they found um, fungi uh, in a Chernobyl Ukraine that are able to utilize uh, radiation um, 
uh, uh, coming uh, from there. The ex exact mechanism is still unknown, but uh, even though uh, these calculations, um, you know, aren't giving, probably aren't giving us um, uh, the exact uh, biomass readings here, they might be indicative of, uh, uh, they might still be helpful in determining uh, and telling you, you know, as like a pointer, like, hey, life might exist here or not. Um, and so how would life uh, survive on uh, subsurface uh, uh, moon? So um, I already talked about the particle radiation here forming uh, secondary uh, electrons and that energy uh, just being uh, uh, dissipated here um, into a smaller um, or more uh, electrons, but uh, with uh, smaller packets of energy that wouldn't be uh, involved in ionizing chemistry. Uh, Okay, sorry. Uh, so um, also forming uh, spores here on the surface. Uh, so if the ice gets sublimated and you uh, can't uh, form secondary electrons, you can uh, go into a spore mode. Ice nucleation proteins that um, uh, basically um, help form ice outside the cell instead of the inside. And then antifreeze uh, proteins that um, uh, basically um, uh, don't keep your organism from freezing. And uh, in terms of testing the hypothesis, uh, easiest uh, way right now would be to use one of the terrestrial electrophilic um, organisms and then using these secondary electrons to power them. And so basically just went over the kind of back of the envelope uh, estimates that we had for direct and indirect electrophy. And now we're just uh, revising our biomass estimates and uh, putting in some um, electrochemistry thermodynamics before uh, finishing everything off. And just some acknowledgments, so. We have time for one quick question before we run. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, you're closer, sorry. <laughs> Hi, um, great talk. So what I was curious was, what, I guess, ratio or metric did you use to determine the translation from the electron volts to the amount of biomass produced. Okay, uh, so that was, okay, so the electron volts in terms of the initial particle energy, I'll back up here. Um, so it's not the energy of the electron here um, uh, that uh, determines how much energy the organism unnecessarily gets. The uh, electron volts here are important um, because uh, they decide how many secondary electrons are produced. And then uh, that in itself produces a current here, and then we use that uh, current then to uh, determine how much uh, biomass. And was that from the uh, previous studies of electrophilic organisms on Earth? Uh, no, so with electrophilic organisms, it's a little bit more uh, straightforward because um, you're using um, cells so you can uh, come up with the exact energy here more uh, directly, but um, with the plasma here, um, it's a little bit different, so we decided to use the current here as a proxy. Oh, okay. All right, let's thank Camille again.